Ezekiel, Ezekiel. You'll have to pardon. We're going to spend quite a bit on the introduction. But um, we spent, I think we spent two or three weeks introducing John back when we did that. And I don't want to do that again. Uh, although it's helpful. So the idea behind the handout, if you grabbed one, uh, is that the handout, just keep this with you, because we might refer to it again periodically, but it's meant to be kind of a reference for you, I just put together, uh, of things that, uh, just to kind of keep things in perspective. If you've got a Concordia self, uh, Study Bible, see, some of you have one of those. It has a pretty decent introduction at the front, I think. It has a long quote from Luther, which... Uh, if you know, Luther wrote prefaces to all the books when he translated them into German. So that's where that comes from. Um, Luther acknowledges one of the things that I, I'd like to suggest to you today is that one of the reasons why the book is not all that popular and not all that well known is that generally people either don't like it or they don't understand it. But I, I mean, that's, isn't that how it usually goes? You ignore, you ignore or avoid the things that you don't understand or you don't like. <laughs> Um, so I think that's true with, with the prophet Ezekiel. And I think it's unfortunate too, though, uh, because Ezekiel offers something somewhat unique. This is why we don't have upholstered chairs. Thanks, Dorothy. Yes, we know. You dumped your water on your chair. Now she's going to break her cup. Okay. I have to teach the just as a distraction to the distraction. Um, I, when, in chapel, we have all the little, the little kids. The early childhood people are all down on the floor off to the side. So most of the time, the kids are always looking this way. <laughs> I'm like, eyes forward. <laughs> but you have to learn to not be distracted, right? It's one of the blessings of having children, grandchildren, whatever. It's like, how can I stay focused with all this? Well, because you have to work at it. Yeah. All right. Um, teachers have the same problem. So uh, back to what we were saying. Either we don't like it um, or... We don't understand it. One of the aspects of Ezekiel, and I didn't put this on your handout, but I think it's, I think it's quite important. Actually, I did put it on your handout. Look at page... Where did I put this? The top of page 2. About Ezekiel, the, the priest, the prophet, and pastor. So I think this is what makes Ezekiel unique and why we should take time to consider him, is that he's a Levitical priest. He also serves as a prophet. Um, and I think he's a pastor as well for people. So well, that makes him unique in the whole scope of, of the Bible, that he would have a priestly training and that he would be a prophetic voice. Probably the closest, closest synonym would, or closest uh, parallel would be the book of Hebrews. So some of you watched the live stream of Hebrews when I did that in the evenings. On, yeah, back during... Oh, what was that, a year ago now? The book of Hebrews in the New Testament does the same thing. It, it speaks prophetically, but it also interacts with the Levitical priesthood. Dorothy, if you can't be quiet, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Do you want to stay in here? All right. Uh, I think she said go somewhere else. <laughs> As you, you can go with her, that's fine. All right, just don't run in the street. All right, so at the top of the page, you see, Ezekiel was a prophet as well as a priest. He exhibits many continuities with the whole goodly fellowship of the prophets. That's from the Te Deum. <coughs> Even as he expresses his prophecy in liturgical and quote-unquote sacramental terms. All right, so I need to define that. Sacramental in quotes means not sacrament as in baptism, Lord's Supper, or even absolution. Sacramental means, in the terms of Augustine's definition, which you know from the small catechism, a word of God or promise of God attached to means, visible or physical means, right? So like in baptism, you have water attached to the word. Luther does that, right? In the Lord's Supper, you have bread and wine attached to the word, his body and blood, right? Um, even absolution, you, uh, if you run with Melanchthon in the Augsburg Confession, absolution, the pastor says words, Really, the pastor is the physical representation of the absolution, Jesus coming to forgive you. So uh, Melanchthon says absolution is sacrament, and then in the Augsburg, but the rest of the confessions limit it to baptism, Lord's Supper. So 
because absolution flows out of baptism and the Lord's Supper anyway, right? So it doesn't need to be a separate thing. Um, but when we say sacramental, we recognize that throughout the whole Bible, from Genesis all the way through, God is attaching his promise to signs, to stuff, right? So like all the Levitical sacrifices, you heard about some of those today. I mean, the body and the clothing and the house, all those things matter, that they be holy, that they be kept apart, and that they be clean, especially when it's used in the, in the context of the church. So sacramental meaning, um, he, talks, he talks quite a bit about physical attached to word stuff. So we'll watch for that as we read. Thus, he is one of the best exemplars of a minister who combines the Abram, Abrahamic, why, why do you write down words that you can't say? <laughs> Abrahamic and Mosaic strands of Old Testament theology. So Abraham, the promise, right? The offspring, the seed, as numerous as the stars of heaven or as the sand of the seashore, if you could count it, right? And remember, the promise is given to Abraham before the law is given to Moses. Paul tells us that explicitly. Um, he reminds us explicitly, I should say, in Galatians. So that, uh, but the two are put together in Ezekiel. So both the promise, law and gospel, if you want to say it that way, or gospel and law, um, which are comparable to the Pauline and Petrine strands of New Testament theology. So sometimes people set Peter against Paul or James against Paul. Peter and James go together. Um, not fair, really. Um, they're just speaking of the same thing from different perspectives. Same with Abraham and Moses. Ezekiel, like other prophets, calls the people away from the cultic abuses and back to justifying faith in Abraham, as does St. Paul in Galatians 3 through 4. All right? So we've talked about this. And you've heard me preach on this, is that there's a way that what we do in church can get in the way of actually why we do it. <laughs> does that make sense? I'm going to say it a different way. Like you can get so caught up in that we have to do things this way, or we always do things this way, that we forget like why we were doing it in the first place. For the forgiveness of sins, right? For love, for peace, for you know, to receive Christ's word. Uh, so there, there are times where things that are neither commanded nor forbidden by God, but, um, but which the church has instituted for the benefit of delivering God's word, there's times where those things then get in the way of God's word. Because they become a thing unto themselves. They take on, what do we say, a life of their own, right? And they no longer, um, for all, serve that purpose. And so then they, they have to be omitted. So cultic abuses. Uh, a good example of this would be the serpent on the pole, right? Where God institutes it. Moses crafts the serpent, bronze serpent, puts it on the pole. And then the people look upon that sacramental, right? There's a promise attached to the sign. They look upon it and they live. And then later on, um, they decide that they're just going to worship that and never mind God, the one who gave the promise attached to it, right? And at which point it has to be destroyed by Nehemiah. All right, so there's an example. At the same time, he, like a faithful priest, calls people who already read... Oh, no, I haven't read that yet. At the same time, he, like a faithful priest, calls the people to a renewal of right worship after the manner of the Old Testament divine service in liturgical purity. That is, uh, the priestly language of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2, which we'll talk about eventually. As a book combining prophetic faith, or prophetic faith and priestly liturgical sacramental concerns, the closest parallels the book of Hebrews, as I told you. All right. Um, there's a famous, famous uh, maxim. You guys like things that are maxims, right? Little phrases that are easy to remember. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, so it is. Uh, which one? What were they going to say? Oh, now I have to remember what it is. Well, that's not going to work. You have to, have to remember, I have to remember how it goes. I can tell you who, who said it. That's getting me closer, isn't it? Okay, now I remember it in English. Now I'm trying to remember it in Latin because that's what you really want. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, shoot. I wanted it in last Latin. Come on, brain. What's going on with you? Uh, Oh, and then I can't ever do spaces on my phone. I don't know why. Aqua time rule of prayer. All right, there we go. Let's see if it tells me. Ooh. Of course, no, it's not. All right, well, here's what it is. See? I'm going to... I'm gonna, it's supposedly smart, but it's not telling me the answer. I have to, like, go click on the link. But... I want to say it's something like this. The rule of faith. 
Do I have another pen? I do have more pens. Okay. The rule of faith. The rule of a prayer. All right. We'll say something like that. So what he was suggesting is that is that um, faith and liturgy. I should say equal. Liter. Oh, got to spell it right. Liturgy. They're not equal. No, they're not equal. Um, but they do, they do inform one another. So what you believe affects how you worship. How you worship affects what you believe. That was, this guy's name is Prosper of Aquitaine, or Aquitaine. That's all you have to know. I wish I could remember it in Latin. I can't. You can look it up. But it's the rule of faith. And so his point was, is what you do change, can change the way you, what you believe. So, for example, the Roman church had to create a whole doctrine of sacrifice because they were sacrificing things. Right? Or they had a doctrine of sacrifice and then they had to change the way they worshipped in order to match. Ah. So the two things go together. And Ezekiel is going to have that all over the place. Where it's like, well, is he talking about what we believe or is he talking about what we do? Well, they're not, like, they may be distinguishable, but they're not separable. Um, maybe you've heard this. There was a famous, um, I can't remember who said it, um, but there was, a, there was even a book published by Concordia Publishing House that said, um, Lutheran, it was called Lutheran Doctrine Evangelical Practice. I can't remember the guy's name that published it. So his argument was that we can retain Lutheran doctrine, but we can worship like, like the generic evangelicals, the Arminians. You know, all the megachurch or whatever people around you, the, non, the non-denoms, the Baptists, the You can worship like them, you know, sing their songs, adopt their liturgies, but still retain Lutheran doctrine. That was his argument. Of course, a fundamental denial of this wisdom from 1,400 years ago that, that the church had largely believed. It's like, no, there was a, another guy before him who said, well, you can have Lutheran practice, but, or no, Lutheran doctrine, but Catholic practice. Right? Now, Lutherans, right away from the beginning of the Reformation, including Martin Luther himself, said, uh, no, the things we can retain that confess what we believe, we retain. That which, if we can't retain doing things that contradict what we believe, those things have to be omitted. Make sense? Yeah. And then we also have to watch, the inverse of this, is we have to watch the things that we innovate. When we add something new, we try something new, that it doesn't actually then force us into creating some kind of doctrinal reason for it out of you know thin air because then we make up doctrines like Rome does and even everybody does that to some degree all right um, Ezekiel is also called second paragraph there a to be a pastor that is a watchman of the flock as he styles it in chapter 3 and chapter 33 so there's two citations uh, and you hear 33 in the lectionary so God charges him to proclaim the divine word which is a matter of death and life both for himself and his hearers and both now and for eternity. And you can see the, we'll have commentary on chapter three. His responsibility descends, depends not at all upon whether this, the sinners to whom he preaches do or do not repent. Maybe I should say that again. His responsibility depends not at all upon whether sinners to whom he preaches do or do not repent. This is something people forget. It's like pastors don't get, get to choose what they preach and they don't get to decide whether what they preached was what they should have preached based off of how people receive it. <laughs> uh, but we have egos too. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so we like people to come out and say, Pastor, I enjoyed the sermon or I really appreciate what you said. Um, and, but we also um, don't like it when people say, you know, I didn't, have, I didn't have any clue what you're talking about or I really didn't like what you said, that kind of thing. So we're sensitive to that as anybody else. But it really doesn't matter. The only question is faithfulness. And that's Ezekiel's point. His success is measured only by his fidelity in preaching judgment and eschatological salvation. And that judgment is what's really going to bug us when we read Ezekiel, the way that he proclaims judgment. If he fails to warn the sinner, God will hold him responsible for the sinner's blood. If he carries out his duty to preach the word, he will have saved his own life and that of the sinner too if he repents, just as St. Paul says to young Pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 6. Hence, Ezekiel's ministry is a model for all pastors in these latter days when the pressure is so great to scratch itching ears. And the imminent event is not the destruction of Jerusalem, but the disillusion of the entire world to be followed by the new and eternal creation. So I know we bumped into that theme when we were looking at Zechariah. 
You know, especially chapter 14, I think Vicki made the comment, or maybe one of, maybe we all did to some degree. It's like, this sounds very contemporary to us. Uh, when you read Ezekiel, it's even more. Because uh, he's, uh, uh, Zechariah was kind of, kind of vague, I might put it that way. Not, not as particular as Ezekiel's going to be. He's going to describe things in great detail that we'd rather not him describe that are happening around us or even amongst us uh, that need to be repented of for the sake of salvation. So um, I think that's why, at least based off of my reading so far, uh, this is what's really powerful about reading Ezekiel is that it pertains... Where's Dorothy? Oh, okay. um, It pertains really to our contemporary setting in a way that maybe... Um, Maybe we've forgotten. And I, I think this is a theme. Because like I mentioned when we let in, Ezekiel speaks prophetically. Um, but uh, I kind of recognize this in my own preaching, especially uh, during the beginning of the days of lockdown, those Sundays, those first couple Sundays in particular. I remember like, like that situation that we were in had to be preached into we had God's word needed to be put into it so that we could understand what was happening uh, around us and amongst us, right? Um, there's always a danger, though, is that lacking the advantage of, of well, or vantage point of perspective, being able. I mean, it's, you can't step back and say, "Oh, now I understand what happened in March of 2020 or February or January of 2020." I mean, now I can, but I couldn't then, right? So then. You know, I don't know. Did anybody go back and look at sermons from then? <laughs> I haven't. I don't honestly want to know. Um, maybe I do a little bit. I'm slightly curious to find out. Like, like I, d- I distinctly remember preaching that the Chinese Communist Party took over the country. But, <laughs> and that may still prove true. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you, so your life changed then, too. Yeah. But, but anyway, my point was is that you... It doesn't, the, the problem with speaking prophetically is that obviously what, what you're, the pastor's job is to preach God's word into the situation, um, but it doesn't mean you always get the particulars of the situation right. right? You don't necessarily understand what's actually happening in that moment. Um, but you can understand what God has said about, like maybe just broadly about that kind of situation. Right? Um, now, Ezekiel obviously has a level of inspiration that your pastor does not have. <laughs> so um, I think he does see things a little bit more clearly than maybe we see in the moment. So there's that aspect too. And he does speak broadly enough that the things he says is going to be apl- applicable to the things we experience as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Where should we go next? Let's do some history. Let's, so let's put it into context. That's on the front part of your page. And you'll have to pardon me just reading it, but... We got, we got to get the... Context matters, right? Um, is it everything? No. So maybe we have to talk a little bit about interpretation, too. <laughs> um, the, the biblical context, so the, the actual historic context that happens, it, it, it affects the way that Ezekiel speaks, of course, because he's talking about situations and kings, and he even names some of them in particular. On the other hand... Uh, that doesn't mean it's not applicable to us today as well, or it wouldn't be considered canonical. It wouldn't have been included in the scriptures if it had nothing to say to us today in our setting. Uh, but there is a danger that happens. And so like in the academic world, they say it's purely historical and it's not applicable today. We don't want to go to that extreme. Then there are also those who are the other extreme. It doesn't even matter if it happened at all because it has this, you know, this transcendent truthfulness to it. And it, Ezekiel didn't even have to be a real person. There could be three Ezekiels for all we care, right? It doesn't matter. He could have, maybe, maybe one of his students made up what he said, you know, like, like Plato did about Aristotle. Not Aristotle, Socrates. You know, Plato just made up all that Socrates stuff. There's people who say that. It may be true. I don't even know, right? It's different here with the scriptures. All right, so we don't want to go to either extreme. So it does matter, the history of what's happening. Uh, fortunately, we are about as well informed about the history of the ancient Near East in Ezekiel's time as of any period in the Old Testament. Right? And here's why. Much of our knowledge comes from the Bible itself, especially 2 Kings 22 to 25, and then it's parallel in 2 Chronicles 34 to 36. If you didn't know that, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles tell the same story. 
actually first Kings and first Chronicles do too, just from different perspectives with different details. All right. And my, my, uh, my suggestion to you is that Chronicles came later and it adds, um, an element of preaching to the history. So it gives you theological interpretation of the history. That would be my suggestion. But anyway, and much of the last half of the book of Jeremiah also tells us what's going on. In addition, we have Jeremiah actually preaching from back in Judah about what's happening in Babylon, Ezekiel preaching from Babylon. Okay. Uh, we have fairly detailed records from Babylon, which was a world power for only a relatively short time, but that time con coincided fairly closely with Ezekiel's own lifetime. If the 30th year in Ezekiel 1.1... Now, oh no, what happened? Did I turn it off or did it turn itself off? Oh, that's so sad. All right, we'll turn it back on. Now it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month. That's mighty particular, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you see it right there? I was among the captives by the river Kabar. All right. Um, if that 30th year refers to Ezekiel's age at the time of his call, that would place his birth about 627 B.C. or shortly afterward. Hey, if he's 30, who else was 30 when his ministry began? Hmm. At, the, at the moment, Assyria still ruled in all its glory and ostensibly at the height of its power. Yet by the time Ezekiel came of age, so when Ezekiel was born, Assyria was in control. By the time he came of age, Assyria had disappeared as a nation, had been con conquered by the Babylonians. Externally and ultimately fatally, the, the major challenge to Assyria came from the Chaldean or Aramean people, the Babylonians. So they're called the Chaldeans, that's their tribe, but they, they're, the nation or the, that they settle is called the, is Babylon. That's the city and then the... the, the uh, so... Chaldean and Babylonians are somewhat synonymous. One refers to tribe, one refers to nation. Uh, led by Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, and their allies from the northeast, the Medes. So if you say the Medes and the Persians, right? Um, they work together. The ancient capital Ashur fell in 614, and Nineveh fell two years later. Assyria made its last stand at Haran, but the city too fell in 610 when Ezekiel was about 17. The Egyptians under Pharaoh Necho marched to, to Assyria's aid. I don't know if you know, do you know this history? So it, the Egyptians come all the way from Egypt up to Assyria, which is north of, of, it, of Judah, to help them against the Babylonians who are to the east. Yeah. At uh, the Megiddo Pass in 609, so we're here Megiddo in That'll be referred to in, in uh, Ezekiel. The Judean king Josiah lost his life in a futile attempt to stop Necho's march north. So Josiah tried to prevent the Egyptians from aiding the Assyrians. That's part of the history there too. The Assyrians, with the help of their Egyptian allies, attempted to retake Haran in 609 and failed. The Assyrian defeat left Egypt and Babylon to contend for succession to Assyria's world hegemony. That contest was decided at the battles of Carchemish, and Hamath, that place is still there, isn't it? Hamath? Yes, it is. In 605, with Nebuchadnezzar himself leading the victorious Babylonian army. So how does Nebuchadnezzar become king? With his big statue out in the wilderness? By defeating the Assyrians and the Egyptians. All right. The Battle of Carchemish is mentioned by name in Jeremiah 46, verse 2. All right. So getting a lot of context here. What are we up to? 605, and we started at 627. All right. Shortly after Nebuchadnezzar's great victories, his father died, Nabopolassar, remember, and he had to return home to secure his throne before he could consolidate his power in the, the Levant, as it's called, that whole region. That, it's a really fertile basin kind of thing. But in short order, the Babylonians returned, and Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, became Nebuchadnezzar's vassal. So if you remember, the Babylonians kind of, like the Romans later, just allow Judah to continue, but they just pay tribute, right? And they have to follow Babylonian law. All right. Um, he remained a vassal for three years, probably 604, 602, but then rebelled, hmm, partly relying on Egypt's hollow promises of aid. See, Egypt wants to get back at Babylon for losing at Carchemish, so then they make promises to Jehoiakim. This is all in the Bible. You can read it. Uh, Jehoiakim died, 
he was probably assassinated before retribution for his rebellion arrived, and his son Jehoiakim succeeded him and was left to pay the price for his father's folly. Sorry, children. In that same month, what, what are the things that get passed on to your children, whether you like it or not? There's some deaths, right? They, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. They'll just forgive them all. Uh, in the same month, the Babylonian army marched against Judah, and on March 16th, 597, Jerusalem surrendered. So this is long before what we read in the last book, Zechariah, which was towards the end of the exile. This is the beginning of the exile is what we're hearing about now. Jerusalem surrendered. Not only King Jehoiakim, but much of the nobility, including Ezekiel. Remember, he was trained as a priest in, in Judah, now becomes, as a member of the priestly family, was exiled to Babylon. So he's one, this is one of the, remember when, uh, when they finally do set up the temple again in Jerusalem, that the, all the old guys wept? We read this in our daily prayer. They all wept when they saw the temple because they remembered the glory of the previous temple, Solomon's temple. One of those would be somebody like Ezekiel who remembered what it was like before, right? Um, where were we? Not surprisingly, the deportees were settled in old Chaldean territory in southeastern Mesopotamia, modern day, or modern Iraq. Yeah. So they, they, they move anybody who can who basically anybody who could take over, they just move out. And just put them as far away as possible. It's like, let's just send them to Siberia, basically. <laughs> you know. Five years into the exile, in 593, Ezekiel's call came. Right? So he hasn't been a priest for five years. He's a young guy, 30 years old. This was the fifth year, chapter 1, verse 2, in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of Jehoiakim's captivity. See? He's very precise on the dating here at the beginning. Uh, counting inclusively, the usual way of counting time in the Old Testament. All right, so in the fifth year, not after five years. By the way, this is really helpful for you to remember when we talk about Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. It doesn't mean he rose the, from the dead after three days. It's on the third day. It's actually not even close to 72 hours because he was put in the grave Friday afternoon, and he appears to the women while it's still dark on Sunday morning. So how many hours is that? I mean, it's at least... 36? Yeah, it's like 36 hours, maybe. Sometimes people say, oh, it's a mistake in the Bible. <laughs> All right, fine. It's on the third day. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, good. Uh, third day. Where were we? Third days. Okay, almost two-thirds of the book records the prophet's words and actions from then, so it's the fifth year of his exile, until the final catastrophe in 587. So that's when they go back and they destroy everything. All right? And so two-thirds, so that's like the first 30-some chapters, is all just prophetic words in exile about what just happened to them. So now we're at the beginning of the exile, the 70 years in Babylon. All right? Uh, in 33, verse 21, come the words of the messenger with the dreaded news that the city, Jerusalem, has fallen. Wasn't there a movie about something falling and it was about Washington, D.C.? It was, it was years and years ago. Something is falling. Olympus has fallen. What's that? Olympus has fallen. Olympus has fallen. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Something about Olympus. It's a, Gerard like, Butler? Yeah, Gerard Butler. It's a code word for, what, for, for the president or something. Anyway, Jerusalem has fallen. The rest of the book then is eschatological. Right? So Ezekiel probably personally is in despair, <laughs> right, over what happened. There's no more Jerusalem. And so now he's looking forward to the new Jerusalem. And actually it turns that it gets much more optimistic from there on out. Because <laughs> he, he doesn't put his hope in, in uh, going back to Judah. The rest of the book is eschatological. In God's own good time, the recent sad history will be reversed. We know that still another insurrection and probably still another deportation occurred around 582, apparently upon the assassination of Gedaliah, whom the Babylonians had installed as regent in Judah. Uh, and Jeremiah was, remember Jeremiah was there for all of that. He didn't get exiled. So 40 to 41. So maybe we should read Jeremiah next in like two years when we get to it. Just be, let's be honest. Still, we hear nothing of this in Ezekiel. 
The last dated prophecy in the book, Ezekiel 29.17, is in the 27th year after Jehoiakim and exile, and Ezekiel's exile, that is, in 571, which gives the prophet a total recorded ministry of somewhat over 20 years. Ah, so 50 years. So the, the book is going to span 20 years of, of his preaching, teaching, basically. Right? And again, that whole first two-thirds of the book, basically... Everything's gone to hell. So his preaching kind of is a little bit difficult. And I, maybe that's one of the reasons, again, that we don't get into the book too far. Because <laughs> you're like, good luck getting to chapter 30. Same thing happens reading, um, reading Job. You ever tried to read through Job? I was talking to my mom about this. She's, she did, I mentioned the Bible reading plans, and she's been doing one of them that I suggested. And she just does one chapter of Job a day. I'm, there's seven other parts of the Bible you read, but she's been reading Job. Is one of those seven. And getting through all 40-some chapters of Job, I think it's 40. Uh, even a chapter a day is really, it's, slog, it's a hard slog. Um, I remember when Brad was first, he was diabetes, so he was yeah. 12. Yeah. He had to be in the hospital for like a week. Okay. And we get there visible one day, and here he's reading something in the Bible, so I said, what are you reading? He said, Job. Good for him. Oh, it's completely appropriate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. God, God actually allows the devil to take from him almost everything, right? And then. Yeah, that's right. Including his friends, his wife, the whole deal. Yeah, his children all are dead. His home, everything's destroyed, right? Uh, and yet he remains faithful, which is it's a miracle. All right. Uh, turn to the second sheet again. Just turn the page. I'm going to talk about interpreting the book. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but, I, but I actually I think it's useful um, to learn is that the, uh, the Renaissance, so actually even the time before Luther, so even medieval uh, Catholics had what they called a fourfold sense of Scripture. Have you heard this before? All right, fourfold sense. Um, sometimes we discount this. Because we're like, ah, eh, it seems kind of impositional, like you're just trying to make the Bible do four different things, whether it wants to or not, right? Um, we kind of do the same thing as Lutherans, though. We're like, well, how does this teach us law and gospel? He's like, well, sometimes we're reading something, and I don't know if there's, there's any, that you can wrestle any gospel out of it. And there's other times where we're like, this is not law at all. There's nothing lawful about this. It's all, Jesus died for you. <laughs> it's like, don't make that law. It's not law. It's not at all. Not even a little bit. Well, Jesus died for you. That means you're a sinner. Okay, fine. I got it. So we can be kind of imposing on the text. But what, what this offers is, is we're reading through. Uh, and again, keep this as a reference. We might look at it from these different perspectives to think about it. And it may be it, the text that we're reading in particular may um, have one or more of these things going, or all four even. So first, there's the historic meaning of the biblical passage. And it remains factual and foundational. Right? So we're not going to ever discount the historical. Uh, by the way, Lutherans are, uh, Luther himself would say that our method is historical grammatical. So we look at his, the history, and then we look at the grammar. Um, I had somebody on Facebook. Who, who was watching the live stream yesterday? So it was on YouTube, right? I don't know who that was who said that, uh, that they present things as too academic. And I thought about it later on, too. And I don't, I don't know what the comment was referring to exactly. It's to be offensive. Not trying to be offensive, so I'm academic. It's like, well, I thought maybe I just tried to take it in a positive light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they were saying you're doing a good job of. Oh, oh, yeah, as yeah, a yeah, positive. Having an academic answer without being offensive. I don't know. Yeah, I was trying to be like, okay, you know, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just trying to be like, I'm 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 trying to and academic has kind of a negative connotation. It's like, oh, I have to go to school. Yeah. Really? Yeah. People want, they want. These days. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's plenty of academic institutions that we can actually criticize. That's for sure. I didn't understand what you were trying to say, actually. So I just... Welcome to the internet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so history matters. Grammar matters too, right? Um, and that's the second point. Creedal or doctrinal conclusions follow based on the text. So we read the scripture, we learn what the words mean, we learn what the mean, words mean in that construction, you know, sentences, all that kind of stuff. And then that tells us what we believe. It doesn't go the other way around. 
You don't get to say, here's what I believe, so let's find Bible to prove it. You can do that, um, but <laughs> you, can, you, you can do that to prove the doctrine of purgatory or <laughs> the doctrine of, um, oh, I don't know, whatever you want to say. Every, everybody, every, once saved, everybody's saved or something. Uh, tropological, so there's the technical word for this one, tropological. Uh, that is the moral implications. So how does this affect how I live? Right? Not every text is going to do this for us, I think. Um, not everything has a moral lesson. And the Bible isn't writ written principally as moral lessons, I would say. Uh, but there often are moral lessons. There's something we can learn as to how we might live. All right. Based, again, but it's, 